risen. Yes, he has. Well, uh, as one of our favorite days of the year as a congregation, as a group of Christians, it is uh, oftentimes you build up, you get a lot of hype, you get a lot of excitement, and then, uh, you know, everyone comes in and there's a lot of guests and there's a lot of families and there's a lot of uh, people that, that come around and before you know it, it's just been a lot of hype and a lot of excitement, a lot of, you know, what's going to happen next and we tend to lose the perspective on things and and that's why this morning when, when Angela woke up and saw the news and she was telling me about the events that had taken place in Sri Lanka, which certainly puts things in perspective of this broken, fallen world that we live in. Amen? Amen. We find ourselves in a place to where we are uh, hopeful, yes, maybe, but uh, we are resolved to just say, my, my Christian experience, my walk with the Lord it pertains to this. I come to church. I leave the church. I come to church again and I leave the church again. I, I, I come to church... And I leave the church, and before you know it, you've missed the whole point of the joy and the beauty and the hope of resurrection. Today, I'm asking you the question, what do you do with the resurrection? What do you do with the gospel? What do you do with the news that Jesus is indeed alive? I want to ask you today to turn in your copies of Scripture to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. This is the last chapter of Matthew, and uh, and I'm going to do this. I, I know that sometimes we come in and, and we get really busy with things. Billy, you may have to help me with this, and there may be some in the back, Chris, you may have to help me some back there, but if you came in today and, and uh, you need a copy of Scripture, uh, if you will raise your hand, I want you to be able to follow along. We're going to read quite a bit here at the beginning, and uh, there's one over here. Christian, if you don't mind helping us back there, uh, don't be shy, really, because other people have walked in with the Bible, and they've left it somewhere. So I want to make sure that everybody gets a copy of it, and you can see where we are. If you're borrowing one of ours, if you've already picked up one, it's page 993, all right? 993 is where Matthew chapter 28 is. And so as you make your way there, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand in honor of reading God's Word aloud together. I'm not going to ask you to stand the whole time because I've got many verses that I'm going to read here as we begin today. So if you found Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to ask you to turn back the page to Matthew chapter 27. I want to begin with this context in Matthew chapter 27, verse 33. Matthew chapter 27, verse 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him, that's Jesus, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. When they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God, and come down from that cross. In the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, so let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, that's high noon, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. This is from 12 to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink. 
the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and get this, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion, one from Rome, and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also come, had become a disciple of Jesus. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Jesus took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Thank you. You may be seated. The Bible continues in verse 61. As Jesus was placed in the tomb, and the stone was rolled over the tomb. In verse 61, Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away, say to the people, He has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard they set a seal on the stone. In chapter 28, it begins after the Sabbath day. This is approximately 40 hours later. As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and he became, and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. My question to you today is this. What do you do with the resurrection? What do you do when you hear the news that Jesus is alive? Today in the sermon we're going to examine five different types of responses in relation to the news, in relation to this grand experience with the reality of a risen Christ when the news has been revealed, when the news has been broken that Jesus is alive, what do you do with the resurrection? Today in your sermon notes, if you have those handy, you have a writing utensil, the first fill in the blank today is our first response. And the first response is from the women. The women, and we see three of them there, here in chapter 28. Mary Magdalene, one who has been um, uh, freed up from uh, seven demons that were inside of her. Mary, the mother of James the Less, may also be called Joseph or Yosef in, in your copy of Scripture. And then Salome, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, this is not the first time we've seen these women. We've seen these women all throughout Jesus' ministry. They're serving, they're supporting, they're following Him, they're learning from Him. And at the same time, Jesus has loved them and taught them and healed them and spent time with them, has counted on them because they have helped support the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. These women have been with Him every single step of the way, even through the judgment, even through the crucifixion, the burial. And now they come to the tomb. 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 says it's after the Sabbath day. It's the first day of the week. And they have come with one purpose, to clean and anoint the body of Jesus. This is a very caring act, but also a very dangerous act. Because you don't know who's lurking there. And to approach a tomb like this, and a place like this, and a time like this, in this feverish pitch of persecution against the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now potentially all of His followers, a very dangerous act, but nevertheless an extreme act of love and devotion. What they find, though, as we see in the Scriptures, what they find is something that they never expected. And you can tell that they never expected it by what they carried in their hands, spices to anoint the body, and the question that was in their mind, the question in their minds that Mark 16 reveals to us that they're asking themselves before they even get there, who's going to roll away that stone for us? Many speculate that the stone could have weighed up to a ton of approximately 2,000 pounds, and I don't think three women are going to be able to do that. The fact of sealing the tomb with the guard there, with the Roman seal upon it, they came not expecting resurrection. They came not expecting the stone to be rolled away and the place to be empty. And you can tell that by what they had in their hands and what they had in their minds. But it's their response. It's their response that is the key to our study today because according to verses 2 through 7, there's been an earthquake, <clears throat> there's a rolled away stone. There's an empty tomb, there's an angel, and there are unconscious guards laying on the ground, and there are instructions from the Lord. And if you'll note that in between verses 7 and 8, there's no hesitation after all of that, and then the Lord speaks to the mouthpiece of His angel. There's no hesitation between verse 7 and 8. Immediately they left, and they went to tell. And so when you're filling the blanks today, there's no hesitation from revelation of God to the instruction of God to the obedience of His servants. What a response, huh? God has revealed. God has instructed. And immediately they go. In verse 8 it says, They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to His disciples. What is the key response of the women today? It is this. It is faith and testimony. It is a going and telling. It is, I believe what I've heard and now I must share. Even in the shock and awe of the moment, even with all of their perplexing questions still unanswered, even while all the prophetic scriptures are veiled from their sight and veiled from their understanding, they are compelled to follow the angel's instructions by going and telling the disciples. It says in verse 8, they left quickly with fear and great joy to report what they had seen. They believed, they obeyed. And they went and they told the disciples this was news that they could not, nor would not keep to themselves. And eventually, you, you read in other gospel accounts, eventually when their hope was revealed and their seen, they worshipped Him. Oh, to be like these women. To follow Him, even when we don't understand even when our questions are more than our answers, even when something great or small has happened, when something perplexing has happened, when something confusing has happened, we know that we've heard the Word of God and we are to go and we are to do it just because He says so. This is the response of the women. Can I get an amen? Well, the women in the house today. Amen. Let's go to the men now. Let's go to the men. The second one are the disciples. The second response we'll look at today is the disciples, specifically the 11 remaining apostles, minus Judas, who in his remorse for betraying Jesus has gone out and hung himself. And at first, these disciples scattered during the arrest time in the garden. Only one remained uh, through the, the judgment time. Only one remained at the cross. But the gospel accounts give us the idea that they have reassembled of sorts and, and they're maybe possibly back in the upper room here, but they're trying to uh, reassess, or they're trying to process the last 36 hours and trying to formulate a plan as to what to do next. You can imagine the loss, the brokenness. They're grief stricken. I can imagine they are terrified, thinking that the next knock on the door could be coming for them. They know what's just happened to Jesus, they've seen crucifixion before. And in the devastation of the loss of their loved one, their fallen hero, could it be me that's next? So 
So they were devastated and they were terrified. This is not the ending that they had hoped for. And they're at a complete loss of what to do or where to go. And maybe they've been up all night. Certainly they're weary. Certainly they're frightened. And certainly they are confused. And then early in the morning, right a little bit after dawn, some of them have probably just dozed off and there's a frantic knock on the door. Is this the time? Is this the time? Somebody looks through the crack in the door and they see the women and they open the door. Are you crazy? What's going on? And all of a sudden, <laughs> What are you talking about? They open the door, they close the door, they're still afraid that somebody's going to come in and then the words just start spilling out of them. He's not there. He's not there. He's risen. He's not there. The guards are gone. There was an angel. There's an empty stone. There's a, there's a stone. There's an empty stone. And whoa, 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 whoa. at 6 a.m. in the morning, Matthew says they came with fear and great joy. Mark says that they were astonished and they were trembling. And so I'm sure that the disciples woke up from their slumber and began rejoicing. Now, the first response we get from Luke chapter 24, it says, The words of the women appeared to them as nonsense and would not believe them. That phrase, would not believe them, is echoed in Mark's gospel at their first response. Right? Like they said today, they refused to believe. They refused to believe. Now, this happens in my house every once in a while. My wife typically gets up before me, sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours before me. And she's already been able to process the day. She has a strategy. She has a plan. And she walks through the room, <clears throat> sometimes quieter than others. But when it's time for me to wake up, she knows it. And so she comes through and she begins to talk to me. Okay, now at 9 o'clock today we need to do this. And at 10.30 we need to do this. And somewhere you need to make sure you get Ava from school. And then after that we've got this thing tonight at, at church. And then after that you need to pick up Kayla. And on and on and on it goes. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know I'm not going to remember any of that, right? You know I'm not going to get that. She's up. She's awake. She's alive. I'm not. <laughs> And so before I, I would put too much guilt and too much heaviness and too much blame on the disciples, I can understand from their fear, from their worry, their anxiety, from the depression, from the despair. And these women come in and, and, and it's a lot of information and it's really early in the morning. But yet you see this steadfast stubbornness in them that says, you're crazy. You're crazy. They refuse to believe that was their first response. The second response we hear from John's account, Luke's account, that John's account says Peter and John went to go investigate it. Luke account said there were two other followers that, that met Jesus on the road. They saw him, and, and, and yet they reported back, and the disciples still wouldn't believe. The more Jesus appeared to others, and the more eyewitness reports came back, they slowly began to come around. Is this possible? Could it really be true? Which is an indicator of what we see from these guys all along. The women follow. The women obey. The women hear. The women are instructed and they are compelled to act. The men think it's nonsense. And it reveals their second response, this sight only faith. If I can see it, if I can taste it, and I can touch it, I'll believe it. Just sounds like a man, doesn't it, ladies? I'll believe it when I see it. This leads us to the third response. Third response is from a man named Thomas, one of the disciples. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 28. We'll come back to that. But flip over to John's Gospel. If you're new to the Scriptures, where you are in Matthew, keep turning to the right, towards the back. You'll go through Mark, you'll go through Luke, you'll come to John's Gospel. At the end of John's Gospel, chapter 20 is where we're headed. We'll read about Thomas, also called Didymus. Meaning the twin. We don't know who exactly his twin was. But we know Thomas. We all often call him what? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. I think he gets a bad rap on this uh, because of what we are about to read. Because I think they were all feeling it. Now remember, Jesus has been alive now for a little bit. And he's already made some appearances. Look at verse 19 of John chapter 20. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut 
where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Remember the doors are shut, the doors are locked, and they're all hiding out in there. And Jesus just, whoop, he's right there. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced. This is different now. And then they rejoiced when they what? When they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I what? See. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, a week has gone by, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them this time. And Jesus came, and the doors having been shut, he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands, and reach here your hand, and put me to my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas then answered and said to him, My Lord, and my God. There's a quote I read this week. Warren Wiersbe had this quote about the Thomas situation and about all of our situations. Doubt is often an intellectual problem. We want to believe, but the faith is overwhelmed by problems and questions. But unbelief is a moral problem. We simply will not believe. Maybe you've heard this term, practical atheism, before. Have you heard this term? All of us have gathered here on this day, so none of us are atheists, right? We've gathered together, and when this pastor says he is risen, you say he is risen indeed, because that's what we say. And, and then uh, we sing songs, and man, you hear it, you take it in. Some of you have brought a Bible, and probably not a lot of atheists without God people in this room today. But the way we live, the way we exercise our faith, the things that we do not do because we can't see it or understand it, the things that we re retract from or we are repelled by because the Word seems too hard or the instruction seems too difficult for us. Before you know it, become a practical atheist. Oh yes, I believe, you say in your mind and with your lips, but you will not follow through. Thomas was at least honest enough to say, I don't believe it. I don't believe it until I see it. See, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt still has a, just a little twinge of hopefulness in there. I'm not quite sure, but I'm willing to be talked into it. Unbelief is resolute. Unbelief is firm stance. Unbelief says, no, I'm not going there. But doubting Thomas, along with the other disciples, even though they won't admit it, and the disciples today, the response that we have from this is, I need more evidence. Write that in your notes today. I need more. It, the, the Bible's not enough for me. I need more. The promises of the Scripture are not enough for me. I need more. I need to see literally his hands and his feet. I need to place my hand in his side. I need Jesus himself to make a special appearance in person and tell me something. I need more. And I believe in the debate for needing more and for the unbelieving world to demand more evidence and, and the more facts from the Christian life before they would believe in anything we give more and more and more evidence, but you can give it all you want to the modern agnostic or the modern atheist and it still won't help. Because they're resolute. They're resolved in their unbelief. This is what I believe. I'm not quite so certain though that I want to put too much of a heavy burden on Thomas because I'm like this too. And so I resolved to cut Thomas a little bit of slack there's a skeptic in me. There's a need for evidence in me sometimes. Lord, I'd like to know your will here, so if you could, uh, you know, 
show me a sign, <laughs> help me out with a little something, something here, you know. Lord, let me know you love me by having a surprise, you know, thousand dollars in the mailbox today. It'd be great. But I have a bigger problem with Thomas. Where's he been? Why wasn't he with them in the first place? As I looked at it, and I saw the, the phrase eight days later, where, what have you been doing, Thomas? Where have you been for eight days? Everyone's grieving. Everyone's confused. Everyone's broken. Everyone's afraid. Could not your brothers need you right now? Why wasn't he with them in the first place? To me, this whole section leaves us with the importance of continuing to meet together and to be yoked together and not being separated. In 1 Corinthians 12, it, it, it describes the church as a body, right? That's connected together. Hebrews 10 says that, that, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Why? Because solitude is dangerous. Solitude is dangerous. Write that in and fill that in your blank today because it feeds discouragement, it feeds the doubt, it feels the anxiety, and it feeds self pity. Nobody hurts like I hurt. Nobody's lost like me. Nobody's in as much pain as me. So I want to withdraw from the support team. I'm going to withdraw from my network. I'm going to withdraw from the body. I, I, I know I'm only a pinky finger, but I am so sick of being a part of this hurtful body that I am going to withdraw. I got a little splinter between my thumbnail and the side of my thumb this week. I don't know how I did it. But you know how... <laughs> Everything changes when you just get a little boo-boo. The whole tip of my thumb hurt. I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't hold my teacup very well. I had to drink with my left hand all week long. Yeah. I've developed a drinking problem because of that. I've had it all When the piece of the body is wounded or hurting, lost or lonely or despairing or afraid. You need the rest of them to pick up the slack. You need the rest to come alongside for that support, for that encouragement. And Thomas is not there. And then Jesus comes and he says, Thomas, here I am. It's what you've been waiting for, right? Listen to the words that Jesus gives to all of us. To Thomas, to the disciples, and to us in verse 29. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see. And yet have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Blessed are those who have remained, who have come, who have believed and understood. If you turn back to Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, we're done with John for now. We're done with Thomas, but back in Matthew's Gospel, the, the story continues in verse 11 before we get to our fourth response. It says, while they were on their way, while the women were on their way to tell the disciples, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. So the fourth response is from the guards or slash soldiers that are securing the tomb. Pilate has given some of his men, uh, more than likely uh, the chief priest, Caiaphas, has, has helped along with that with some of the temple guards. Uh, for sure, we know a few things about what's happened to the guards. We read the story. We see the circumstances. And we know this about them. They absolutely, of all people, they absolutely know the truth as to what just happened. Okay? They know the truth of the matter. And they also know that they're in big trouble. They know the truth because they felt the earthquake. They saw the angel. They rolled away the stone. They woke up unconscious. They woke up to an empty tomb. They know they're in big trouble because the Roman seal is broken. The tomb is empty. They've been defeated by a clearly superior opponent. And this is not the news that you want to take back to Pilate, right? 
So they run to the priest. <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> You don't want to run back to your centurion. You don't want to run back to the governor. You don't want to run back to your superior officer in this because you know you are in trouble. So they run to the priest and the priest devises a story and gives them some money. What is the response of the guards in this place? They take the bribe and they tell the lie. They take the bribe and they tell a lie as a means of ignoring the truth to save themselves. Now there's an interesting note here, if you'll allow me, this the guards and the soldiers being paid, if you'll know to incriminate themselves. It says in verse 13, they were to tell the story, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. So first of all, they're going to admit that a few of these ragtag fishermen overtook these professional warrior guards, soldiers. Uh, I don't want to admit that I've been beaten by an inferior opponent. I'm not sure that they wanted to either. But yet they were fearful for their reputation. They were fearful for their jobs. They were fearful for their lives. And sleeping on the job, that's the death penalty. We don't want to say that. The Roman seal has been broken on your watch. That's the death penalty. We don't want to say that either. The body's been stolen by these little fisher boys. We don't want to say that either. But they were afraid for their lives. And the Pharisees had to guarantee the lie by promising that they would cover for them if Pilate were to say anything. And so the Easter conspiracy is birthed and lives on. The absurdity of this cover-up story is harder to believe than the resurrection itself, if you want my opinion on it. And over time, in this whole conspiracy, other theories have come up. It says that they have uh, perpetuated this story even to this day. That's when Matthew wrote it back in 60 AD. And even until this day, there have been many theories invented by the agnostics and the atheists over the years. A couple of my favorites today. One is that the women went to the wrong tomb. That's one theory. The women went to the wrong tomb. Which I find very interesting because if they went to the wrong tomb, it was... It's only been about a day and a half, about 36 to 40 hours removed from when they were there last, but they say in their grief they just went to the wrong spot. Interestingly enough, also at the wrong tomb was the angel of the Lord sitting on the stone that he just rolled aside where Jesus could walk away. So the angel was at the wrong tomb. Peter and John eventually came to the wrong tomb and believed. The absurdity of that theory, I think, speaks for itself. The one that has lasted the longest, though, is called the swoon theory. Have you heard of this swoon theory? Jesus never really died. Because of extreme uh, his extreme anemic issue with all the blood that he has lost out of his body through the scourging and through the crucifixion, Jesus only appeared to die and was merely unconscious in a coma-like state due to the anemia. But evidently, 40 hours later, he was revived in this cold, damp, dark tomb and was able to push that 2,000-pound stone back from the inside all by himself. The swoon theory that Jesus never died, he just swooned. And then thirdly, of course, the disciples stole the body. Which is pretty crazy to see how they were willing to be burned alive for that story, beheaded for that story. Some one was sawn in half by a wooden saw for the sake of that story. Another was put in a vat of burning oil to murder. One was separated from society and exiled on an island out in the middle of nowhere for that story. This Thomas rumor and legend has it. One historian said that Thomas was eventually caught and he was flayed alive. While he was still living, they began to peel the skin off his body so we could keep the lie going. Yet the unbelieving community is still so willing to buy it, right? And the story that was widely spread among the Jews to that day is still alive up to this day. The guard's response was to ignore the truth. Finally, we get to these Pharisees, these chief priests and elders, the spiritual leaders of the people, the one behind the lies and the false theories, 
while the believers were worshiping God and rejoicing and witnessing the unbelievers that were plotting to destroy the witness. Plotting to destroy the witness. Write that down today. Without realizing it, the Jewish leaders and the Roman government began to join forces together to help prove the resurrection of the Lord with their absurd claims and, and then to prove forever that they were true enemies of God. They had practically all the law memorized and were teachers of the law and, and were sons of Abraham, but yet proving themselves with their hardened attitude and their refusal to believe as enemies of God. The response of the Pharisees was to suppress the truth. To suppress it, to drown it out, to keep it hidden, to explain it away. This is the response of many in our world today. And it didn't take long for Paul to realize this once he was born again and he began to write to the church and he wrote in Romans 1.18 for the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who what? Who suppress the truth. What do you mean you suppress the truth? That means that they know it. It's been made evident to them because God has made it evident to them. They know what the truth is but they're still willing to look for all the other ways to stamp it out. While all the other believers are rejoicing in the news of the resurrection today, there are going to be many others, countless others, that are trying to stamp it out and just trying to suppress it. And we look at across our world today and all the ones that are being persecuted for their faith, that have been driven underground, for churches that are being blown up today by a man walking in with a vest on, full of explosives, willing to give his life for a lie. Trying to drown out the truth. And all the evidence from their conscience, from creation and God's Word has been made so clear to them, men still choose to resist. Men still choose to rebel against that truth by holding fast to their sin. Why? Because men love darkness more than the light. I would rather be blind than follow Him. I would rather be deaf, dumb, and lame than follow him. I would rather be dead than follow after him. So which one are you? On this Easter resurrection celebration morning, five responses to the news, the glorious news that Jesus is not there. Is that not one of the most beautiful scriptures in all of the Bible when they come looking for Him and the place is empty and the angel says, He's not here. Well, why not? Because He's risen just like He said He would. <clears throat> so which response is most like yours today? For our conclusion, our application to this, I'm compelled to ask you the question, are you more like the women? Faith and testimony is your response. Proclaiming the truth is your response. He has been revealed to you. He has instructed you. And now you're living in obedience and not proclaiming the truth of the good news. And you're willing to leave this place today with the stamp of God's resurrection on your heart. Ready to share the good news. Have you heard it? Do you know it? That Jesus is alive. Or you're more like the disciples. Doubting the truth. The word seems like nonsense to you. Oh, you've heard good things about Jesus. You've memorized some scriptures. You've shown up to church a few times in your life. And here you are again today on Easter Sunday. But yet his words aren't true to you. The reality of the risen Lord is down in. Maybe you're like Thomas and you just need more evidence. You're conditioning the truth. You're placing more and more conditions on the truth. If I see it, I'll believe it. If I can taste it and touch it, I'll believe it. But until then, I'm going to sit over here in the corner and wait for something else. Something more believable. 
something more attainable, something more manageable, something you know that I can sink my teeth into a little bit more. Maybe you're like the guards. You've bought the lie, you've taken the lie, and you're just ignoring the truth. You know what I think? Most people aren't really willing to admit it. But I think a lot of us can come in here today and go, you know what, that was me. I've been fine with coming on Easter Sunday and singing the songs, hearing the sermons, reading the scriptures. But then I'm going to go and I'm going to live my own life. I want to do what I do. I want to go where I go. I want to say the things that I want to say. And your life is a wreck today because you keep looking for love in all the wrong places. You keep looking for truth from all the wrong places. You're ignoring it. You're buying into what the world has to offer you. You're thinking that somehow it could satisfy. But it won't. I hope that there's not any in here today that are like number five, the Pharisees who've heard the truth and doing everything they can to suppress it, to explain it all away. But through our actions, we can do this. It doesn't matter which one of these you want to be. Look at the list. It doesn't matter which one you want to be. Your actions will give evidence as to which one you are. So look at it. In your heart of hearts, as you examine your heart today, if someone burst through the door, even today, and said, Jesus is alive, and He's right outside. Someone get up and leave immediately. Someone go down. Right. Someone go, I didn't hear the trumpet call. I, I haven't heard the angel shout. I haven't... Uh, you know, no one's come in here to, to say anything else. Like, Why would we believe you? What, what, uh, what, what makes you so right? And we'll sit in here where it's comfortable. He's right outside. Eventually, the women and all the disciples, including hundreds more, would be totally bought in and willing to give their very lives for the sake of the reality of the risen, resurrected Lord. The thing that they didn't understand, the thing that they could only hope for was now realized and they saw Him. And they lived for Him and they died for Him. Christianity, this is your last film, the blood to Christianity from the very beginning, from Matthew chapter 28 until now, has always been a missionary faith. It's been a go and tell. It's been a believe and obey. It's been... Here's the revelation of God. Here's the instructions of the Lord. Now go tell somebody. Go tell somebody. Don't be caught, church, today in your doubt and unbelief. Let us leave this place today not to be content to continue to ignore the truth, to doubt the truth, suppress the truth. This is not just good Easter Sunday morning preacher talk. This is what we live it's who we are to be. There are no excuses that you can come up with to excuse you from the Matthew 28 instruction. Go and tell. At the end of Matthew 28, what does it say? Go make disciples. That means to go and tell. As you're going, wherever you go, tell, tell, tell. Teach, teach, teach. Baptize them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, guess what? I'm with you. I'm with you. So we can boldly proclaim today, running like the women with fear and trembling, astonished and amazed, that we would preach Christ and crucified, risen and coming again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He has risen, church. He has risen yes, He has. Lord Jesus, this is Your 
story. This is our hope. This is the reality of what You have done for us. And so, Lord God, I am so thankful to be in this place today with, with this body of believers, Lord, with, this, uh, with the instruction of Your Word, with the celebration of the songs from Your, from your people. And, and, and Lord, may we not be so content with just saying, well, something's got, I need a sign. I, I, I need something physical. I need something I can put in my hands. I need some, no, Lord, You are risen from the grave. You have given us all the evidence that we could ever need. So, Lord, I... I pray that for Faith Church, for the faith members, for the family that's with us today, for the friends that have gathered with us on this day, that when we leave this place, we would leave this place knowing the truth. The truth that has been promised to set us free. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for reconciliation, how we were separated so far from you, and yet you bridged this gap and you brought us hope and reconciliation in this relationship. And we respond to you today with faith, obedience, and a testimony to share. Saints of God, I want to ask you today if you keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed today, let me ask you these questions again. Which one of these are you? Are you more like the women who just you just can't wait to share the news? Are you like the disciples? You've heard it. You've experienced it. It's just hard to believe. And even though you want to intellectually believe it, it's hard to act upon. Maybe that's you. Maybe like you're those guards, the Pharisees, you know what really happened, but you don't really care. Remember, it's not about what you want to be in that list today. About who you are. So I'm going to ask you today, if you would, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you this.